task here and uh, be uh, mindful of everyone's time. So we'd like to get going here. Welcome everyone to our uh, Junior Beef webinar series, our last one. We've been doing this for five weeks and uh, so want to welcome you and thank you for participating. Hope you have found each and every one of these sessions uh, valuable. Um, over the last five weeks and uh, look forward to seeing some new webinar series coming in uh, next year. Uh, so watch for those uh, uh, next uh, year after the first of the year and we'll hopefully have some more coming out. Uh, so I'm going to turn our program over to Tyler, uh, one of our uh, organizers of this event, and he's going to introduce our topic tonight and our speaker and uh, let him take over from here. Thank you, Brian. Uh, my name is Tyler Kralichek. I'm the Ag and Natural Resources Agent in uh, Burley County, and uh, I'm uh, very excited to introduce Kevin Sedevig. He uh, manages the uh, uh, Central Ga Grassland Station down there in Streeter, and he has been uh, one of the guys that uh, at least I know I've looked to from a uh, range perspective, and I know there's a lot of people, not just in North Dakota, but around the country who have uh, taken his advice because it is extremely valuable. So uh, without any further ado, uh, Kevin, we're going to wrap up this series with, uh, with you talking about grazing readiness. Kevin, before you jump in, uh, anyone that's got questions, uh, jump in, uh, put them in the Q&A section or the chat, and we've got people online that will monitor those and ask those questions when it's appropriate tonight. Go ahead. Well, thanks, Tyler and Brian. Uh, it is a pleasure to be on this evening. Um, my topic this evening is grazing readiness. And for those of you who are in North Dakota or from somewhere else in the country, these concepts of proper turnout for pasture based on grazing readiness are the same no matter where you're at in the, in the state, the country, or the world. Plants grow the same no matter where you're at. And they have the same kind of phenological growth that relates in terms of when they should be ready to be grazed or not ready to be grazed. And so I wanna kind of go through the concepts of, of how grazing readiness works and what you look at when you're walking in a pasture to see when do you feel that pasture is ready to be grazed. I do wanna look a little bit at, um, at moisture as it may drive that impact, uh, especially in the spring or the fall. And so we'll kind of go through these step by step. And if you have any questions at all, please add put in the chat. And I don't mind if Tyler or Brian or somebody jumps in and asks that question while we're while we're having this conversation. Um, I have about a 30 minute slide presentation. So there's plenty of time for some conversation if you sure have it. So I do appreciate you being on today. And I want to thank you for jumping on. I don't remember me being a 17 year old student in high school, spending an evening on a webinar. My grand, I'm a little too old for that. Um, but but it is a, it, I sure appreciate you jumping on today and taking your time to, to learn about not only the cattle industry, but also the, the fundamental base of the cattle industry, which is grass and pasture. So I'm going to share my screen here and, and jump on this PowerPoint and let you follow along. Let's go. So hopefully you should all see the, the screen side with grazing readiness. And as Tyler said, my name is Kevin Sadovic. I am the Extension Rangeland Management Specialist at North Dakota State University. And I'm the director for the Grassland Research Station Center, which is located about South Central North Dakota. I've been doing this job for about 34 years and I've got a chance to see much of the US in terms of pastures and rangelands. And like I say, I think this talk should be pertinent no matter where you're at in the country. So let's get into some grazing readiness discussion. And when we talk about what dictates grazing readiness, it comes down to a fundamental uh, ideas of phenological growth stage. And what that means is every grass reaches a level of development where it actually reaches a phase or a time period when you can actually go out and graze it without causing a negative impact on plant vigor or plant growth. And it, it really is a function of temperature and day length. So our plants really do follow that day length cycle. And normally when we get to the end of the spring and summer solstice, that's a time period when most of our cool seasons would have reached their peak phenology to a degree. Um, but a lot of that growth is based on temperature. And we drive a lot of that. You can actually look at how this occurs by looking at growing degree days. 
And every plant has a growing degree day threshold where it reaches that what I call proper turnout. For those of you who, who are involved in the farming industry, whether you plant corn or beans or cotton or wheat or barley, they also have the same kind of level of what is the growing degree day that dictates a three leaf stage or a four leaf stage or a boot stage or a grain development stage. And our grasses are the same way. And so they have this growing degree day threshold where they reach what I would call a grazing, a grazing readiness phase. And so when you, when you calculate growing degree days, and I'm just gonna do a, a little short snippet on this and I'll show you a publication that'll show you how to do this in a few slides, but growing degree days are calculated by taking the maximum daily temperature for that day, plus the minimum daily temperature for that day and creating an average temperature for the day. So you divide by two to get an average temperature for that day. Then you subtract the base temperature for that grass to get the growing degree days for that grass period. The example is typically if you think of corn, the base growing degree day is 50 degrees. For a cool season grass, it's 32 degrees. For a warm season perennial grass, it's 40 degrees. So for an example, if you have a high of that given day of 62 degrees, your low is 38 degrees, you add that up to get 100 degrees, divide by two, you have 50 days. You then subtract that 32 day base day, uh, temperature for that cool season grass, and you have 18 growing degree days for that day. And you do that, you add that up for every day after you reach the, the minimum threshold. For, so for the North Dakota or the cool season grasses, that's five consecutive days where we're above 32 degrees as that base. And I'll show you that in the publication. So when you look at this, if you look at the phenological growth stage for our introduced grasses, and so in North Dakota, that would be like a, a, a smooth brome grass or a crested wheatgrass. If you're in, in Iowa, it would be Timothy. If you're out in the East Coast, um, it could be Timothy or orchard grass or tall fescue. Um, those would be examples of introduced grasses. It takes three leaves to reach a phenological growth stage where it's safe to graze that grass or it's ready to be grazed. For native grasses, so if you live in the, in the western part of the US um, where we have native grasses are still common or dominant, um, it's about three and a half leaf leaves for a native grass. So like a western wheatgrass, or if you're a blue bunch wheatgrass, if you're down south, it could be big blue stem. Whatever that is, it takes about three and a half leaves for it to reach that stage. And I'm gonna show you how that works in, the, in an upcoming slide. So when you look at, at the, the amount of growing degree days it requires to reach this growth stage, this is, a, this is out of the publication. If you just look at the top bar here uh, where we have green needle grass, where you want three and a half leaves as your proper turnout date, it takes 1,209 days on an average of growing degree days to, to reach that phenological growth stage. And you can see how it varies by the native species. Um, it, some are much more quicker, so it's only about 750 days for prairie june grass, but it's almost 1,300 growing degree days for blue grama. For exotic grasses, you can see it's much quicker. They grow much faster in the spring, and so an intermediate wheatgrass is about 655 growing degree days. And so once you reach that threshold, you should be at that phenological growth stage where it's ready to turn out to, turn out to pasture. So I want to show you why we have picked three or three and a half leaf stage as that point where you reach grazing readiness because it had to come from somewhere. And obviously it come from science on looking at when these grasses are ready to, to be grazed. So I, I stole this or I borrowed this graph from Pasture.io. It's a website that looked at them, created some graphics for plant phenology. And the, I'll walk you through this graph. So the top part of the graph shows number one, a grass in the one leaf stage and it has what's called a remnant leaf. This remnant leaf is important um, when it comes to reaching rate grazing readiness in the, in the spring, because that dictates what it, what it grows in the fall. So this is one leaf, this is two leaves, number three is three leaves, and four is four leaves. If you go back to the one leaf, you have to think about, if you learn this in, in high school, how a grass grows and how a grass gets its food. It can't just go to the local market 
and buy food to feed itself. It has to produce its own food. And if you remember, it produces food from water and carbon dioxide. And it takes energy to convert water and carbon dioxide into a carbohydrate or a simple sugar that the plant then uses as a food source. When a plant is just coming up, it does not have enough leaf area to capture energy. Remember, it gets its energy from the sun. So because it lacks the leaf area to capture energy, and it captures the leaf area to take in carbon dioxide, it has to rely on reserved carbohydrates in the root system for it to grow. So if you look at the bottom part of this graph, this is water soluble carbohydrate levels that is in the root tissue that that plant needs to grow in the spring. And you can see how that, how that water soluble carbohydrate reduces as that plant starts to produce leaves till about three leaves to three and a half leaf staves where it's got enough leaf tissue to fully completely reserve or restore the carbohydrates back in that root system. So if you're harvesting a grass at the two leaf stage, it is probably the most susceptible to loss of vigor, thus loss of forage production, if you graze it at that time period. So it's important for to understand why we wanna to wait to that three, three and a half leaf stage so that grass can be as vigorous as it can possibly be to one, withstand the grazing pressure, but two, to produce as much production as it can to support that cow herd or that sheep herd or whatever you're grazing that year, you need to have that leaf area. If you impact vigor, so you do graze at that two leaf stage, a loss of vigor means you have a direct correlation of a loss of forage production, which means you won't be able to graze as long into the grazing season because you impacted that plant's growth. So that's why we look at this three to three and a half leaf stage. And we'll, we'll talk about that, but I wanna show you what drives that three and a half or three leaf stage in terms of one moisture, but also management. And that will then dictate pasture turnout or grazing readiness. Hopefully you're following along and that makes sense. So there's a publication we put out, Dr. Meham and myself put this out uh, actually a couple of years ago and it's called Determining Grazing Readiness. It goes through the, the concept of the three and a half leaf stage. It goes through how to determine graze, growing degree days. So you can track your growing degree days and see when you feel your pastures are ready to be turned out in the spring. So those of you who live in the Northern Plains, uh, we have a lot of snow this year. Um, so temperature is gonna be a, a big driver in phenological growth stage this year because we're gonna have a delay in temperature based on where we're at. If you're even, most of the US is actually a bit cooler this year and much of it's actually a bit wetter, but it gives you an idea how to follow along. If you're interested in, you can Google determining grazing readiness for North Dakota and this publication will come up. So we talk about proper turnout in terms of grazing readiness, but there's a secondary factor that will still drive grazing readiness and that's herbage production. Even though a grass may be at three and a half leaf stage, if you don't have the moisture to create enough biomass, you, could tend, you can still turn out too early because you'll be ahead of the grass's growth. So production is still a driver. And I still always look at that as a secondary driver on should I turn out or not in terms of production. And I'll show you what I mean. So, so point, moisture tends to be this driver in terms of if you do have less spring moisture, you will have less production even though you're phenologically ready to be grazed. And, and the rule of thumb is you want to turn out the cows ahead of grass growth. So as that grass grows, you want to be behind that grass growth versus being ahead of the grass growth. So even though you may be at three and a half leaves, if you don't have the production and you turn out at full stock, the cows will be ahead of grass growth. And that will then also impact vigor of that plant species, which will impact production for that year. So the two really do play hand in hand. And I'm gonna show you some examples how that works. And then grazing history. So grazing management by itself um, only has a direct impact on grazing readiness from what you do in terms of grazing the previous fall. And I wanna show you what I mean by that in terms of fall management, how it impacts those remnant tillers. So 
when you look at herbage production, and we're gonna, we already talked about the phenological growth stage. So let's look at phen at herbage production. Um, this is a this is a smooth brome grass grass that was that I measured in an ungrazed pasture from the previous fall. So this picture was taken on May 10th. As you can see, if, I don't know if you can see my marker here, but this is that remnant leaf from the fall. And then this is the first leaf right here. This is the second leaf. And the tall one that goes to about five and a half inches is the third leaf. So we're at almost about three leaves at about five inches tall. So the next picture is taken the same day in a different pasture that was grazed hard in the fall. And if you look at this grass, this is the same grass. This is still smooth brown grass, but there is no remnant tiller or leaf from the previous fall. So this tiller had to develop or start growth from a new tiller in the spring. So one thing you know is it's about two and a half leaves. So it's a little bit behind, but it's only about three to three and a quarter inches tall. And remember plant height has a direct relationship to production. So this pasture is gonna produce less grass. So you may wanna actually, so what we do is you're gonna to wanna to delay turnout so that grass can catch up to that five and a half leaf one so you don't impact plant bigger. And so you can see how grazing history in the fall will have a direct impact on that grazing readiness in the spring in terms of when you can look at turnout. So, so we look at this amount of growth depending on grazing history and the moisture. And I'm gonna show you two graphs and I didn't, I, I didn't, I'm not a great graphic artist. So I'm gonna to have to go through this with you so you understand what I'm talking about. But I'm trying to show you on the blue line, that is percent grass, grass growth. So on May 15th, about 40% of that grass has grown. If you look at June 14th, it's about 85%. And on June 30th, about 100% of this grass has reached phenological growth stage of maximum production. The green line is actually production. So as you can see, production mirrors the, the growth of that plant in terms of percent growth. And at the peak production in this, in this scenario is 2,500 pounds per acre. So the red bar is, is looking at livestock grazing and turnout. So a cow is going to consume about 35 to 45 pounds of dry matter a day. So this stick takes about 35 pounds. And you can see we turned out these cattle behind the grass growth curve. So these gra the grass is growing ahead of how these cows are grazing. They're going to consume about 35 to 45 pounds throughout the grazing season. And this allows that grass to have the optimum vigor or growth so you get maximum or optimum forage production in this scenario. So let's look at a different scenario where, where you're dry in the spring or that tiller is delayed because of what you did in the fall or you had a fall drought. You have the same growth on that grass growth potential. You turn out the cows ahead of the grass growth. So you can see the red bar is now ahead of or on top of that green bar. And that's just showing that green bar has less production um, as it's growing and the grass, now the cows are grazing ahead of the grass growth. And because they do that, they end up consuming more than is available as that grass grows. And what you'll find in the end is you produce about 25 to 55 percent less production because you lose vigor from those plants by grazing ahead of the grass. Basically, you're hurting that grass. The only way you can fix that is to bring in a grazing system move those cows off that pasture and allow for it to recover enough so that it gets the vigor back. And that's where we talk about grazing systems as a ways to improve your management to enhance this growth. We're not talking about grazing systems today, but I want you to understand that you, you not only look at phenology, but look at when you turn out those, those cows based on where that grass is growing in terms of vigor. I hope that makes sense. Um, I worked on this on Saturday and it, I just tried to figure out to, how to get it going. So. When we look at grazing history and, and moisture, you know, we can control grazing history. So as a rancher, you can dictate when you turn those cows out, when you graze those, those cows in the fall, and how heavy you graze those cows in the fall. Heavy, moderate, light, and how that may impact potential growth or vigor the next year. What we cannot control, of course, is moisture. And most of you, if you're in the cattle industry, you know moisture drives forage production. Moisture will make or break your year 
in terms of, of how much production you can produce and how those cows are gonna do on pasture. So timing and moisture becomes critical. And you've, and you've probably seen this, you know, we could have a below normal precip year, but if we get the rains at the right time, we can still have a bumper grass crop and still do very well in terms of forage production. So I wanna go through this timing scenarios for, for, for plant growth so you can understand how important it is in terms of, of how we look at this grass and how we look at forage production. So this is a graph that shows to your left bar is percent growth. On the bottom uh, X, X line is the dates of the year. So we have April 26th up to mid-November. And the red bar or the red line is the growth of Western wheatgrass. That's a cool season native grass. And you can see Western wheatgrass is fairly low, slow to grow in the spring, but from June 1 to July 1 in the Northern Plains, about 60% of its growth occurs at that time period. And then it peaks out and then it senesces. So all your grasses, once they peak, they're gonna senesce. They're gonna lose leaf tissue as it matures out or gets older. The dotted green bar is blue grama. This is a native warm season grass found throughout the United States, primarily in the Western two thirds of the country. And you can see warm season grasses take more temperature. So they're gonna be slower to grow in the spring. They do most of their growth from about mid June to end of July. They peak production in July, late July into mid August. Then they also senesce. And then if you're lucky enough to live in the Northern Plains, we have a grass called Kentucky bluegrass. Um, if you live in Kentucky, you know it as well. It's a fast growing invasive grass that grows heavily and from mid-May to basically July 1 and produces almost 100% of its growth by July 1, then it senesces. My point is here that, that spring moisture in the month of May and June will dictate 80% of your plant growth for that year. You will know as a rancher by mid-July in the Northern Plains, if you're gonna have a good year or a bad year. And if you live in Oklahoma or Texas, you're gonna know by mid-May. If you live in the East Coast, depending where you're at up and down, um, you can dictate that based on how those plants grow. So in, in Northern Plains, we know that if we have good moisture in May and June, it's gonna be a good year. If we have good rain in May through June or good moisture, we're gonna have a normal production spring and so normal turnout can be expected as long as that remnant tiller was left there from the fall. So the second critical time period is actually in the fall. And that fall rain produces these beautiful fall tillers. Those fall tillers, no matter where you're at in the country, is your first growth in the spring. So you want to have fall tillers to speed up grazing readiness the following spring. So if you do not produce a fall tiller, either from a drought or you grazed away the fall tiller from heavy grazing, you will see a delay in turnout the following spring because you don't have that fall tiller. And I'm gonna show you a really nice fall tiller. This picture I took from South Dakota that says May 10th. That picture was actually taken October 11th and that's a Western wheatgrass tiller. What we wanna see in the fall is lots of tillers. That will set you up to have a good spring in terms of proper turnout for range readiness. So in the Northern Plains in 2022, we did not have a good fall. We did not have moisture. So we don't have very many tillers coming into this spring. And I, I, would, I would expect in 2022, 2023 in the fall, in this spring, sorry, in the spring of 2023, we're gonna see a delay in grazing readiness, one, because we didn't have any fall tillers, and two, because we're probably gonna still have snow into the end of May, early June. And so you're looking for those fall tillers to dictate that. So what I wanna show you here, this is a, a graph that shows you that remnant tiller on the bottom. So that's your remnant tiller that was created in the, fall, in the previous fall. And you can see your first and second and third leaf. If you do not have that remnant tiller, it has to produce a brand new tiller in the spring to produce those first and second and third tillers. That takes about 10 to 14 days extra in the spring to get that tiller developed. And so you, you will know in the fall, you know, as you, as you become a rancher yourself, or if you get in the cattle industry, use that fall tillers to tell you, to prep you for the next spring uh, when you're gonna look at proper turnout. So I'm gonna show you two examples here. This is just a picture 
of Western wheatgrass taken on May 9th of 2017. And it, this was in Oliver County, North Dakota. We had 101% of normal fall moisture. So we had fall tillers. And so if you look at the tillers here, if you look at the peaker at about eight inches, this plant's about eight inches tall. It's at three and a half leaves on May 9th. This plant is phenologically ready to be grazed on May 9th because one, we had a fall tiller, and two, we have a vigorous plant stand that's actually very productive. And so you're, you're really in good stage here on looking at proper turnout by uh, this example. Let's go a year later on the exact same pasture. In the fall of 2020, 2017, we were in a severe drought. We produced about 40% of our own precip. We had no fall tillers. So on, on 2018, five days later on May 14th, we were only three inches tall and only one and a half leaves have developed in this scenario. So we're gonna see a delay in pasture turnout, one because of phenology and two because of moisture. And so when you're walking a pasture in the spring and spring's a beautiful time to walk our pastures, look for those three and a half leaf stages. Don't let the date be your driver. Look for the phenology to tell you where you're at if you got a good spring moisture, you should be able to turn out at that three or three and a half leaf stage. I hope that makes sense. So I always get this question. Um, we got these fall tillers and I just showed you that we need those fall tillers for spring grazing. You know, can a producer graze these pastures in the fall and not have a negative impact on grazing readiness and production the following year? And so our, our great county agents in North Dakota uh, we're kind enough to do some exam, do some data collection for us in 20, 2020, 2021 and 2022, looking at how grazing impacts these fall tillers. And I'm going to show you four grass species. So our North Dakota smooth brown grass is one of our more common, uh, vigorous exotic grasses. And all these, these bars are set the same way. So the blue colored line is the overgrazed pasture the previous fall. The red line is the take half, leave half. Pasture, that, so that's our typically proper turning, our proper grazing management. The uh, greenish yellow bar is our line, is our moderate use in the fall. And that purple bar is our rested cell. And you can see with smooth brome grass, where we grazed at full use or, or overgrazed it in the fall, we did give up growth and some production till about mid May. And what was interesting on brome is it did almost make up at the end. By the end of May, it's one of them grasses that's resilient enough it could actually come back and do well. What I would say on the brome, if you have brome grass, and you're gonna, this would be true of also Timothy or even fescue to a degree. Um, if you did graze it hard in the fall, I would delay turnout because your production is gonna be slower in that first part of, this, of the month, then you can turn out and it'll catch up in the month of June. So our, our great grass, the bluegrass, which for those of you who don't know what Kentucky bluegrass is, uh, it's, it's our typical lawn grass but it invades most of the Northern Plains and Southern Canada. And it can make up 50 to 60% of our pastures. This grass does not, not like heavy fall use. And you can see where we overgraze those pastures in the fall, even take half, leave half. We gave up not only phenology plant growth, but we gave up about 50% of our biomass by grazing in the fall. And so if you have a bluegrass dominant pasture, you're gonna have to delay grazing by almost a full two to three weeks in theory, to catch up phenologically. Now the downfall on bluegrass is it matures so fast, you can't wait that long or it's gonna get away from you. But it just shows you how that fall impact uh, impacts it. So if you look at, at moderate use and rested use, they're virtually the same by May 21st in, in this example. Let's look at one native grass. Uh, I don't think I got two native grasses. So this is green needle grass. The native grasses are more resilient. And I know there's someone on from the, east, from the eastern part of the US uh, the one thing about the eastern part of the U.S. is most of our pastures are seeded pastures. They're not native range. And so you're going to have more of the exotic grasses like I showed you earlier versus native pastures. But if you're in the western U.S. and central U.S. where we have native grasses, green needle grass is very resilient. Whether you graze it, take half, leave half, or moderately graze the rest of it, they're very similar. Uh, they'll reach the grazing radius about the same time. Unless you overgraze that pasture in the fall, then you see we do give up production and we give up some vigor. So we can graze them to some level, but not overgraze them in the fall. And that's also true of Western wheatgrass. Uh, Western wheatgrass is our most dominant cool season grass in the Northern Plains and the Western US. And you can see it did not do well when we overgrazed that pasture in the fall. 
but you could graze it. So my, my, my rule of thumb is here on native grasses. Yes, you can graze them in the fall, but don't graze them very hard. And you shouldn't, otherwise you will not impact those grasses through that season. And so as we look at, to summarize the, the grazing readiness time period, you know, it's important to understand that May, June rains is critical for productive pastures and good hay production. And I know most ranchers have to put up hay. That May, June period is just as important for hay production. And you can also determine if you're gonna have a good hay, hay crop or not a good hay crop. When we look at fall moisture, fall moisture will dictate next year's plant growth in terms of vigor and grazing readiness. So do look at your fall period. Don't graze them very short in the fall. If you're gonna graze them very, if you do have to graze them short in the fall because of a drought, know you're gonna to have to defer those pastures the next spring till probably into mid to, mid, mid to late June so it can recover from that event. And then spring moisture or lack thereof will also impact production. So that pasture turnout may still be delayed even though it may be phenologically ready due to the, the spring moisture. So wait for that three and a half leaf stage. And, and if you get, grab the publication, we'll show you examples what to look for, but you're looking for three full leaves. The three and a half leaf stage will look like you have four leaves. So that fourth leaf will be about half as long as the third leaf. That's your three and a half leaf stage. In the Northern Plains, that's about mid-May to the end of May. I would suspect in 2023, we're looking at closer to the end of May just because of the cooler climate that we've been in and the dry fall we had last year. Um, so gr grazing before readiness, just if you wanna look at in terms of cost to you, if you go out too early and you can't get some deferment or some recovered rotation system, know you're gonna give up about 25 to 50% of your pr production potential by grazing too early. My rule of thumb is in the Northern Plains for May 1, for every day you go out in the first part of May, you give up three days in the fall. In the middle of May, it's two days. And at the end of May, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So just think about how, how that may impact you uh, into the following season. And there, that's my last slide. I think I actually finished a little early, so we should have some time for questions. Um, and I do want to open it back over. I'll turn it over to Tyler or Brian and see where we're at in terms of some chat or some questions. Kevin, thank you for all the good info. Um, obviously, right now we're not quite ready for uh, for grazing, um, but uh, you know, looking at a year like last year, um, you know, once that uh, that temperature starts to to heat up, um, you know, what's kind of the critical temperature that you might run into when that grass is really going to start uh, tire firing up for from a soil temperature perspective? Sure, and it, and it comes down to soil temperature, Tyler. Um, we get it. We our soil temperatures above fifty degrees you'll see it start to grow much more aggressively. And, and it, for me, it takes that 65 to 70 degrees before it really takes off. Um, and you can look at the growing, you know, I could, what's, what's funny is most ranchers don't follow growing degree days, even though we have examples where they can do that. It's amazing how many farmers do use growing degree days to track uh, development of their crops. And so it really does work hand in hand. Um, but I look for about 65 to 70 degree days for our cool seasons where it really starts to get really starts to take off. If you live in the southern part of the US or even in the southern part of the eastern part of the country, it's closer to 70 to 75 degrees for our warm season crops. And, and on the average, our grasses will, will grow, cool season grasses will grow optimum at about 75 to 80 degrees. For cool season grasses, it's about 85 to 90, well, 90 degrees is kind of your optimum or maximum level. And so once you get above 90 degrees, then you'll start to see some losses. Or what happens is it evaporates more so the grass has to use more water to stay alive. It's basically its own air conditioning. I know uh, up here in North Dakota, what are some different, uh, I guess, grass species if you're trying to, uh, obviously you talked about fall management. Um, you know, if you're trying to start a new pasture, um, what are some things that you would recommend in terms of a, a grass seed blend? Are you talking for a perennial mix or a annuals? A perennial. So for the Northern Plains, you know, my favorite perennial mix is going to be Western wheatgrass, green needle grass. I really like side oats grama for my warm season. Um, and I'll put in some slender wheatgrass because it's a very aggressive seed. They're still a native. 
And I still like to put a little bit of a, a big blue in my stands. If I'm in the western part of, the, of North Dakota, I'll go with a little blue and maybe some prairie sandry, depending on the soil type. Um, but you can get by with about a five or six way mix um, that really gives you a nice native mix. Uh, the caveat for natives is it takes, tend to takes about two to three years to get a stand established before you can graze it. And so you have to be able to, to plan that you, that you have to wait that long to graze those pastures when you put a seed a mix in. All right, are there any questions from anybody looking at the chat? I'm not finding uh, anything at this point. I see Jill makes a good comment on Endon. And for in the Northern Plate, North Dakota, we have an Endon, which is our North Dakota Ag Weather Network. They do calculate growing degree days for you for a location. And so it's a really cool tool you can use to, to track growing degree days within your own area. And what's, what's important to understand in North Dakota is Growing degree days can vary quite differently from Castleton, North Dakota to Dickinson, North Dakota, and from Minot, North Dakota to Jamestown, North Dakota. That, that north, south, east, west can be a difference of 10 to 20 growing degree days on any given day. And so it, it will differ across the state. So if you get a chance to use those resources, and I'm sure most states have some kind of resource that will track it for them, and it's just a great tool to use. Also in the chat, if you guys are interested in uh, any of the previous talks that we've had, uh, uh, Brian did post the uh, YouTube link to get onto those. So uh, you can always go back and watch those. Um, I'm going to launch a quick uh, poll for you folks to uh, fill out, if you would, please. So, so while they're filling that out, uh, Tyler, uh, Jeff asked, should, there, should we be trying to manage pastures to reduce the amount of bluegrass? And if so, can we do that? And, and Jeff, that's a great question. Uh, bluegrass is the dominant exotic grass that you'll find in North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota, Alberta, uh, Saskatchewan, even into Northern Nebraska, uh, Iowa. It's become one of our, our most aggressive cool season exotic grasses. The one thing about bluegrass is it's extremely resilient grass. And so you can do some timing of, of, of grazing. And if I was gonna try and hurt bluegrass, that fall period, if you looked at those graphs, if you graze it pretty hard in the fall, it impacts vigor the next spring. So if you come back and graze it hard in, in the spring, you will reduce bluegrass. The debate is, is can, you, can you do that enough to actually have a long-term impact or negative impact without hurting your native grasses? And, and I don't know the answer to that. My gut feeling is you, you can't. Our native grasses are more resilient. And so the management on bluegrass, what I typically try to do is manage to use the bluegrass effectively, but management so you also don't get it to increase. You know, our, our best tool to reduce bluegrass is really a combination of grazing and fire. The Northern Plains is fairly, fire is not common. And so we try to do it with grazing alone and it's very difficult. But the, the best pastures that are low in bluegrass are pastures that are grazed fairly hard in the spring. And I mean spring like May and June. So if you do that, that, that heavy grazing at that time period, you will impact it. But you can't do that year after year or you're gonna give up a lot of production. And you, you can't give up the production because then you can't carry as many cows. So there's a fine line of how to do that and how, at what level you should do it in terms of numbers of years. That's a long answer to your question, but hopefully it, it gets to the point. <laughs> Kevin, this Kurt, <clears throat> does hoof action early on in our grazing um, season <clears throat> when we're kind of waiting for those grasses to get get to that readiness? Does that help or deteriorate um, that that pasture at all? That's a great question, Kurt, and and the answer is depending on the grass species. So if you have a pasture with western wheatgrass in it, or or even um, um, smooth brome grass in it. That hoof action breaks those tillers. And what they do is respond by producing more tillers. So hoof action will increase the sod forming grasses, at least initially. They will, but they'll do the opposite to bunch grasses. So if you look at green needle grass, crested wheat grasses falls the same level, but it's a little bit tougher to, to get a negative impact. They will actually have a negative impact on our bunch grasses like green needle, 
and needle and thread and even a little blue stem. And so if you do want to increase the vigor of Western wheatgrass, you can use that hoof action to benefit it as long as you don't do it so many years in a row when all of a sudden you start to kill the, the Western wheatgrass. Does that make sense, Kurt? Yes, it does. Thank you, Kevin. You bet. Kevin, what's a, a good strategy? I know there's all kinds of different topics about, uh, you know, high in, uh, intensity, low duration. I mean, what's, what's your recommendation if you've got adequate uh, pasture? So when you look at uh, grazing systems and grazing systems in terms of how intense you should graze your, your strategies, um, rotate every day, every five days, 10 days, 20 days, recovery. The more you, the more intense you graze, the more uniform your grazing will be, the more uniform your grazing is, the greater potential you have to increase efficiency of regrowth. So the, the caveat is, is if you get uniform and graze, and graze at a high intensity, low frequency, you increase efficiency of grass growth. Then you want recovery and you come back and graze that growth, that plant growth. The, the, the caveat is, is there's a threshold. So the, the more intense you get, as you start to do the intensity, you get a big bang, you get a big increase in, in efficiency, but that levels off. And so going from a, from a 20 day uh, rotation to a 10 day rotation to a five day rotation, it levels off. And so there's a fine line. I'm not a huge fan of really intense rotation because for one, it, it, it takes labor because you got to move cows every day or every two days. It may take more fencing. So you have more input costs. And I think you can do the same benefits by doing a rotation every seven to 10 to 14 days. In the Northern Plains, we typically recommend a 30 day recovery in the Eastern part of the state and a 45 day recovery on the Western part of the state. And as we get into the summer, we make that 45 and 60. Um, so you see producers using the word regenerative ag or regenerative grazing. They're using that concept of efficiency of growth by the more intense you graze. But I, I what we've seen is, and that there's some pretty good work out of Nebraska that's looked at that. If you get too intense, you actually get way more hoof action or trampling effect. And so you actually lose production that goes to the ground versus in the cow's mouth. Not that that's bad. You can use that root, that plant tissue to help with the soils, but they found that, that, that what I call a mob grazing scenario is actually the least efficient in terms of actually intake by the cow. How's that for a long answer? <laughs> Good, very uh, explanatory, thank you. Um, another question is how can we determine stocking rates? That's a, you know, that's a tough question because you, if you ask a rancher, how is he gonna determine stocking rate? He's gonna tell you, well, I know. I've been doing it for 20, 30, 40 years. I know what my stocking rate is. Um, for, a, for a person coming into a new pasture or they're running a pasture, um, what I typically do is I look at the soil type the soil type will give you an average production for those ecological sites. And then what I start as a rule of thumb is I look at if I produce 2000 pounds an acre on a, on, a, on a pasture and you're gonna consume about 500 pounds that goes through the cow, a thousand pound is left for plant vigor. And then you have 500 pounds that's just lost through natural senescence. So it's about 25% harvest efficiency. So that means 500 pounds goes through the cow. Cow consumes about 900 pounds a day. It means it takes about an acre 1.8 acres for that cow for a month. That's a quick and dirty way. There's some great publications out there that kind of go through how to do that, how to, how to determine carrying capacity and stocking rate. And so that's kind of how I do it is based on the soil type, ecological site and production. When you get into grazing system, that harvest efficiency of 25% goes up to 35% and 40%. And so you actually get a higher stocking rate because of that. That's an answer that I can understand, but most of the students probably don't understand what I'm saying. And I'm sorry, <laughs> but that's what I would use is actually the soil type and the production potential, and then budget 25% of it for the cow to consume. And it's funny, you know, Kurt's probably thinking about this, you've been around a long time. A lot of ranchers know what their stocking rate is on the average. What, what's, what happened is, especially in the Northern Plains, we've gotten wet, or at least we were wet to, up to 2016. Um, we actually had a higher carrying capacity 
because of the wet cycle. And then we tended to be understocked because of that. I think the, the drought we've been in now for the last three out of the last five years has brought us back to reality a little bit. And I think we're numbers are probably closer than we used to be. And we're probably not where it used to be, but at least it's a little closer. Are there any other questions out there from our uh, participants? I would like just one from a participant. <laughs> I feel guilty that I feel like I didn't didn't hit the target today. At least based on the polls, it looks like we got some response on learning something today. You know, I'm not seeing anything, Tyler or Kevin. Oh, we oh. got one. Oh. <laughs> Came over in the Q&A. Catherine, could you define growing degree days again? Sure. So... Growing degree days is a, a calculation that determines, um, it's basically created from a formula to get to when you can determine how many days it takes for a plant to grow phenologically. And so what you do for growing degree days is you take the maximum temperature for the day plus the minimum temperature for the day. You add those up, you divide by two and you get a number. That's your growing degree days. So if you wanna figure out growing degree days for corn, you'd subtract 50 and it, it, that's what corn is. For our grasses, for cool season grass in our plains, we subtract 32 degrees. If you were in Texas or Oklahoma, you would, you would subtract 40 degrees for warm season grasses. And so it's basically just uh, an option to, to determine when you're at a certain phenological growth stage that was developed. And it was developed mainly for the agronomy sector of the industry in terms of agriculture. But um, the USDA era station out of Mandan took that data and, and created the, the growing degree days needed for the native grasses and these other grasses in the 1980s. So it's actually about 45 years old now or 40 years old now when they developed that methodology. So Kevin, there is another question that popped up from, a, uh, from Chance. How can I tell if I have overgrazed my pasture or just full use? That's a great question, Chance. And, and, and here's how you look at if you overgraze the pasture. So every grass has a growing point. And so when you look at a grass, the bottom leaf, so you look for that bottom leaf, and then the second leaf above it, there's what's called an inner node. And that node is its growing point. If you graze above that growing point, you did not overgraze the, the grass. It is still actively growing. So you're above the 50% use. If you consume all of the leaves except for the bottom leaf, and you may have got below the growing point, then you graze, then you have overgrazed that, that grass. So look for the bottom two leaves. If both your bottom two leaves are intact, you did not overgraze that, that tiller. If you graze below those that bottom leaves, then, then you overgraze it. So that's how you, it's an easy way to look for it. Look for the bottom two leaves. Great question. And that's true of any grass species. Doesn't matter what, where you're at, it's those bottom two leaves. So Kevin, I'm gonna follow uh, Chance up with that question. I did not do a very good job managing my pastures. <laughs> I overgrazed based off of your uh, latest description. How long should I potentially expect to um, have that pasture recover? What, what, what's the length of time for me? It's usually about 10 to 14 days. So what you have to do is you have to have a new tiller develop in the spring because you took it off in the fall. Your roots are still fine. You know, they have what they are, unless you've done that for many years in a row where your roots have died back. But if you only did it once, your roots are still the same. So the next spring, it's about a 10 to 14 day delay. So expect a 10 to 14 day delay in because that tiller has gone. And if the temperature is cold, like, it's, like it might be, it could be later on top of that. But that's what tip, rule of thumb on the grass is 10 to 14 days. <laughs> 
Another one I just thought of for you, Kevin. <laughs> Sometimes, especially out here in Western North Dakota, we have the uh, a nasty thing that happens to us in the spring of the year uh, called fire. Uh, mm -hmm. Gets into our pastures and it's before we're even thinking about turning out. Uh, mm -hmm. What? Uh, how do we manage that from that standpoint? Uh, what do we need to do there to uh, take advantage or manage the effects of a fire? So if we get a, a wildfire, and like we saw last year, we had some May, we had some March, we even had some February wildfires, you basically did what you did in the fall. You removed that tiller. That bottom remnant leaf is gone. So you're going to get a delay, delay in growth that spring. The, the caveat is though, because you got a black soil, your temperatures now will be higher. So you'll get a little compensation because you have more heat at the ground surface. Remember the, heat, the temperature drives growing degree days. So you get a microclimate effect at the ground surface. So you get a delay in production, but you get a little bit of bump back because of the, the heat of the timing of it. What In the Northern Plains, our grasses are so resilient. We tend to, the, the data has shown at a Mile City, Montana, as well as in North Dakota, that we don't have to wait a year to graze those pastures once they have a fire. In fact, what we typically will do is wait for about, I think the numbers we look at are about four to six weeks before you turn out uh, on those fires uh, uh, on an average. And, and we actually, at the grassland station here, when we burn, we only wait about two weeks to do it because we're looking for a heavy disturbance. Um, on a large scale though, we don't have other places to go. It's more like four to six weeks, depending on moisture scenarios. Another one just popped up uh, in the chat. Following the wildfire aspect, does the wildfire affect the root of the grass? So that's a great question. And it comes down to the, uh, the heat and the intensity of the fire. And so if, if the fire was hot enough and moved slow enough to where it actually got into the soil profile to get to the roots, it can have a negative effect on that plant, especially if it's a bunch grass. If it's a bunch grass, you may actually kill that grass. If it's a sod former, you will not kill it, but you will delay it. Most wildfires are driven by wind. And so we can, we rarely get a heat, a temp, a fire hot enough that actually gets into the soil profile. And most times on the spring fires, the soil is also moist. So it cools it off so fast. The, the most negative would be a lightning fire in the middle of the summer and it's dry. And if it's not wind driven, you'll see the greatest negative effects on plant mortality into those scenarios. Plants will recover but they take time to recover them because if you get death loss. What typically happens in the Western part of the US is exotic grasses fill that niche so fast. Uh, cheat grasses are more, more common example that comes in after fires because you got a death of some grasses then these annual grasses come in and invade and take over those pastures. Question well, now we got questions coming in. <laughs> uh, you got a Q and A question from John. When replanting a pasture, is there a practice that is better than the others, such as drilling the seed into the ground or broadcasting the seed and then harrowing it in, or could the cattle hooves work the seed into the soil? That's a good question. And, and the biggest rule of thumb when you think about in terms of plant development or plant growth is, is, the, best, is the greater your seed to soil contact you have, the more success you will have in terms of uniformity of germination. And so I like it to be drilled in, because when I drill it in, I can put it in the soil. I can then close that furrow and pack it. So I can, so I can get a really nice seed to soil contact. If you, if you broadcast it on and you harrow it in, follow that with a packer so that you get really tight seed to soil contact. That is the most important part. No matter what method you use, is you wanna pack it as firm as you can to get seed to soil contact. And then it has to rain. So it also comes down to timing of when you seed it. The best time is gonna be in the spring when you got spring moisture. The second best time, and it almost or almost really a horse apiece, 
is a dormant seeding in the fall. So if you seed in like October, November, when the ground's about to freeze, you drill it in, you can capture that spring moisture. Those are the best times because moisture is now not a limiting factor and you can get good seed to soil contact. Hope that answers your question. I see Faith has a question also. She said, if you get a spring frost, how much damage does it cause the grass production? And that's a great question. In the Northern Plains where we are cool season grass dominant, when those grasses come up, they're fairly frost tolerant. And so it has to get below 22 to 24 degrees before it actually nips the top of the leaf. And so if it only gets to 30 degrees, 28 degrees, it's not gonna affect cool season grasses. If you're in the South where you're warm season dominant, like an Indian grass or a big blue or a switchgrass, that will actually have a greater impact. And what happens is the grass will actually freeze at the top. As long as it doesn't go all the way down to the root, it'll freeze part of the leaf, the leaf will fall off and it has to produce a new leaf. So you'll get a delay in production um, when you get them on the warm season. So it depends on the severity. If it's just a frost, you're fine. It'll slow the growth because you've got less growing degree days. But if it gets really cold, then you'll see some death loss on the leaf tissue. As long as you don't graze it while, it's, while that's happening, it'll, it'll recover in terms of production. Well, I'm gonna make call for la any last questions here. We're gonna wrap up here about 7.30. So any last questions, if you wanna uh, get those into the chat or Q&A section, uh, do that at this time. Uh, again, uh, posted up earlier the uh, where you can go to watch the previous uh, webinar series or sessions over the last four weeks. Tonight's will be uploaded there as soon as that is ready uh, as well. So uh, keep that link available if you want to go back and watch any of these webinar series. So, uh, and Scott just posted it again here. So uh, utilize that. And so, Tyler, anything you have? I wonder if Tyler had to step away for a second. <laughs> just for a second here. So <laughs> thanks again, everybody, for coming in. We appreciate you guys, uh, not just tonight, but the whole uh, whole webinar series. Hopefully you were able to learn some good information along the way. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for... Uh... <laughs> Got a little following me here, sorry. Uh, but yeah, no, thank you so much, Kevin, for uh, coming in tonight. And uh and talking about uh, grazing readiness. It was a lot of great information. So um, thanks for everybody who got on and, you know, answered the polls and hopefully we'll get you some good information going forward. Thank you. Well, well, thanks for the invite. Appreciate it. Well, with no other questions, I think we're going to wrap up tonight and thank you guys and for participating. Uh, any questions, reach out to us. We're happy to help you whenever we can. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin. You're welcome. See ya. Have a good evening.